Super nice. Hey, everyone. My name is Fons, and I have a fancy microphone so I can turn around. <laughs> I've never had this before. I'm really honored to be here. So cool, keynote, what the hell. Um, I'm going to first try to get to know you so that I can adapt my presentation a bit. Otherwise, I'm just saying stuff you already know. And um, also, I would like to use the keynote so that we can get to know each other. So um, I'm going to do some talk to your neighbor activities. So it only works if you sit a bit close together. So I want sort of groups of two or three. So um, move around the chair so that you can do the neighbor activities. <laughs> it's going to be nice, I promise. <laughs> So I'm happy with my new microphone. Maybe you can tell your neighbor how you are doing today and what you're most excited about today. And who you are. Who are you? Okay. <laughs> so now we know who we are, what weather we're feeling like, and I would like to get to know you. So who has done Use Julia before? Oh my god. <laughs> Whoa, I didn't expect that. Um,
just like the REPL or Jupyter or VS Code. And we have some fundamental principles. One is interactivity. Uh, we believe that a programming environment should be as interactive as possible. It's the main task of a programming environment, at least an educational programming environment. And we do this using reactivity, which means that we run your cells like a spreadsheet and we analyze all your code. Uh, then reproducibility is our second biggest one. Um, we want when someone sends you a Photoshop file and you open it, it works. It never crashes or whatever. And if someone sends you an Excel file, it always opens and works. So why did we give up on notebook files and um, scripts and sort of computational documents? It's sort of the standard now that you receive a computational document and you're like, yeah, but where's your PIP file? And you know, <clears throat> that it never really works. And we try to take some really strange decisions that not everyone agrees with, and then um, try to make these notebook files always work. <coughs> then we use Julia, which is a super nice language. It's fast and dynamic and blah, blah, blah. But what I like most about Julia is that it's really easy to read, and I think it's a great language for high school, bachelor education. It's just such a nice way to talk about science. And yeah, it's education. We made Pluto. So um, that makes it really easy to make some decisions. Like if there's a feature. demo, and I'm going to keep it super simple. I didn't prepare 3D graphics or an HTTP server or blah, blah, blah. I'm just going to do some numbers, and then you have to use your imagination. Because in Pluto, you can use all the Julia packages, and you can use the whole Julia ecosystem. But I'm just going to show what you can do with numbers and strings, and then you have to imagine the rest. So the basic thing. <coughs> is that you write code and you can see output. So I can type things um, and then run it and then I can see the results. And I can make multiple cells with multiple calculations, one divided by two. And it becomes really interesting when you use variables. So I can do A is one plus one and B is A times a thousand. And now you can see the first thing, which is reactivity. <coughs> so when I change A, B also changes automatically because um, we, Pluto understands all the links between all your variables, just like in Excel. So when you change one thing, the rest also changes. And this is really nice um, for quickly prototyping stuff. But also, it helps you avoid mistakes, because you never have this out of scope thing that you might know from Jupyter, where you have to restart the kernel and run all, or stuff like that. Um, and also, we have a really nice file format, which normally I don't show when I introduce it. But I think this is a bit of a technical audience. So here, on the right, I have so this notebook file is saved as home fonts Eindhoven demo. And then here I opened it in VS Code. And you can see whenever I change it, it updates the file. But this is the whole file disk, no more in the file. And 
Um, the big thing is that we don't put output in the file. The file is only the input. And also, we make sure that the notebook file is a Julia file. So that's a bit tricky. But you can open any Julia uh, <laughs> Pluto notebook. You can also run it without Pluto, just in the repo or something. And we have to do some tricks to make that work, because in Pluto, it doesn't matter in what order you put things, because we just see it as a computational graph. So um, here I did 1, then A, or sorry, then B, then A, then 2. And uh, you see that in the file, we actually swapped A and B. Because if you run this in the REPL, A needs to run before B. But then at the bottom of the file, we store the order that you want things in. Also, I'm giving this demo on a Chromebook that I bought secondhand from an elementary school student in the Netherlands. So things might not be super fast today. But it's cool that Pluto works on a Chromebook, no? Uh, for example, I can interpolate A into 1, and then you see in the file it moved down a step because A needs to be in front of 1. Okay, Then we only have Julia cells, but you can use Markdown inside of Julia. So I can say, hello, Eindhoven, and write some text. Mathematics is fun. And now this is Julia code that creates uh, prose, and it returns it. And then when I just hide the code, it looks like text. Right? And this is how you can create whole documents with Pluto. Um, and what's really nice that this is code is that you can also put variables inside of it. And it all works. OK. Oh my god, I love questions. Sorry? Yeah. Um, oh, I don't want this big. Yeah, I can do some LaTeX. Sorry, Chris? The question was whether we support LaTeX. And I can say, yes. Oh, that's a bit lame. The square root of yes. And this is really nice. Um, we support it because Julia supports it. And that's the case for many things. Like, does Pluto support differential equations? Well, yes, because Julia supports differential equations. And um, yeah, same with LaTeX. We support it. OK. Yeah. All the time. Right in the face. So, so what if you define some uh, two things that are mutually recursive? Can you give an example? The question was about recursion. Can you give an example? Uh, no, I mean, in two different cells. In two different cells, if you have, say, A equals to uh, B minus 1, B equals to A minus 1, something like that. Yeah, oh my god. I've never tried this before, but let's see. <laughs> <laughs> so B is 1 divided by A, and then so A needs to be 1 divided by B. And no, it doesn't work. It detects it. It says cyclic references among A and B. And then it suggests to put them all into one cell. So that's something you could do if you really want this. Um, but still won't work, of course. But you can put them together in a block. And then now. Um, you don't get the recursion error, but A is not defined. But actually, we do have a special case for uh, like recursion among functions in different cells, and this is supported, but not among global variables. And I, I think in Jupyter, you can do it. Right? First, define A, then have B depend on A, and then redefine A to depend on B, and it just works. But I think that's a mistake and not a feature. <laughs> OK. Um, more questions or things I should try? Yeah. <laughs> oh, 
I have a question about the begin end block. So yeah. why is it necessary? Well, it's not super necessary, but it's just there to semantically say that they are one block. Um, but it's a bit awkward sometimes because sometimes, so we want to motivate people to make as many cells as possible because the more cells you have, the better you can debug your code, for example, and the more you can see. So the case I had before, um, what was it? So B is one plus one and A is one divided by B. So this works, but I would say it's better to put this in a separate cell just so that you can see both results. So there's a lot of reasons why more cells are nicer and it's sort of an, one of our nudges to make you use more cells. Now, hit it. So it might be because of the screen, but I find the contrast a bit low. Would you mind switching to a light theme? Oh, sorry, yeah. Mm. I know how to do that. Ah. Is this better? Yeah. yeah, I also think so. <laughs> nice, I wanted to do some um, large language models. <laughs> no, just kidding. Hello. <laughs> so um, I'm going to talk about interactivity. So the first way that Pluto is interactive is that just by editing code, hello Eindhoven, you see that results change. And in huge notebooks, this is so cool. Like if you have one cell that loads your data set and then you do your whole analysis, you just change the file name of your data set and then it runs your analysis on your other data set. And there's so many reasons where this is super nice. Um, <clears throat> but what's really nice for demos and presentations is, um, I hope it works, yes, <laughs> good. Um, yeah, I'm stressed about the Wi-Fi, but not about Pluto, of course, because that's super stable. Is this one? You can bind Julia variables to HTML elements or JavaScript. And so that was a technical sentence, but basically you can have sliders and text fields and stuff, and then we can take those values from your browser and make them your Julia values. And the API is quite simple, so it's always add binds, then the name of your variable, and then whatever input element you want. And this is super easy to use because text, um, it's just a string. It's not uh, wrapped in some interactive thing. So you don't need to write event handlers or listeners. And so now I can do something. Hello. OK. So I wanted to look at the, the letters of this text. So, um, hello, and then whether they are a vowel or not. So I can also use LaTeX inside of Julia, like the in character, which I think is really cool. Um, that's all of them, right? So. Now I can check whether something is a vowel, like R is not, but E is a vowel. Or I can count how many vowels there are in my text and give it a name. And now I can try things. And you see, as I'm typing, if I type a vowel, the number goes up, and if I don't, it stays the same. And this is a large language model, right? So large language model demo. This took um, five kilograms of CO2 to train. Your text. And then number of files. And you can see I'm interpolating here. I think it was num vowels. So now I can just make some space like this and I have a dashboard or it makes more sense if this is there. Check. Can hide it also. And you see that with hiding code and rearranging stuff, you can really 
make a dashboard. And maybe it doesn't look as good as some of the dashboards you see online, and maybe those are hard to make in Pluto, but more simple dashboards that just get your point across are super easy to make. Yeah. Um, question? Yeah. There's a microphone. Okay. Yeah. Here. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, my question is, uh, what about when you have uh, heavy computations, and yeah, some sometimes you don't want to repeat those. And uh, is there a way of caching uh, results uh, in such a way that you, yeah, reactiveness in this case will be something that uh, you don't want to have? Should I repeat the question? Okay, <laughs> it's a super good question and it took us a long time to have a half decent answer to it. Um, I think the question comes from, if you see I'm changing one thing, every, like everything is rerunning, especially if you're changing something really high in your graph, so something that a lot of things depend on. And if your notebook is doing uh, actual large language models, then you can imagine that every time you type something, it's stuck for a minute. Uh, about caching, you can just use any Julia caching package, and they work in Pluto. So you can make your function memoized or something, and then this will work. But I feel like that's often not enough. And one feature we made was um, disabling cells. So for example, I could disable the numval cell. So now when text changes, the cell doesn't rerun, and that's why it's grayed out. But this one still does. So yeah, you see, if I'm changing it, letters is still rerunning, but numvals is not. So if that's an expensive cell, you can disable it. And it's reactive, so we know that things that depend on the disabled cell should also be disabled. So you're seeing that my little demo um, dashboard is also being disabled. So it's actually really effective. You can just pick one point in your notebook and say disable, and then everything that depends will be disabled. And then you can try small stuff and then re-enable the cell. Thank you. That's perfect. More questions? <laughs> Was there another question? Ah, Chris. Hi, Chris. Nice to see you. <laughs> Can you programmatically interact with the enabling and de uh, in unenabling cells? So, for example, can you say if if this uh, you know this differential equation solve is successful, then re-enable these cells and and reevaluate my analysis? That's a super fun idea. Never thought of it. Uh, it's not possible, I think. Or maybe with JavaScript, it's possible. Um, but there is a talk later today about Pluto hooks, which has a lot of uh, advanced functionality in Pluto to let you sort of control reactivity. And there you can make cells um, rerun themselves if they want, or you can have them access a variable from the previous run. It's not really an answer to your question, but there's like more advanced reactivity in this talk. But then uh, I think it's a nice idea to reflect it in the GUI, like uh, to show it as disabled. Now, um, okay, I'm going to enable this cell again and try to use plots. Oh my God. <laughs> I actually ran it this morning, so it should be fine. Oh my god, it worked. Um, so I'm going to make a dictionary where every letter is mapped to how many times that letter occurs. So this tells me for each letter how many times it's in my text. So for... Um, Eindhoven, 
we see there's two n's and one h. And then I think I can do, there's docs also. I can do plot.bar of this, and then I should get um, a nice plot. Count is not a function. I should always program with an audience. <laughs> yeah, it works. Okay, so now I can move this plot. Put it there. Hello. And it's all interactive. That's nice, no? So it's a dashboard. <laughs> yeah. Mm. There's something really cool that I want to show, but I cannot show it because of the whole Chromebook HDMI situation. But it's called recording. Um, it's this button, but I'm not going to show it. But you just installed Pluto, so you could try this yourself um, with your neighbor. So my question to your neighbor is, have you ever made a Pluto notebook? Is it on your laptop? If so, can you open it and show it? All right, who has made a Pluto notebook and can show it to their neighbor? OK, let's do it. If you have a Pluto notebook that you can show to your neighbor, do it. Otherwise, show any nice visualization that you made <laughs> and that you're proud of. <laughs> and think how much nicer it would be in Pluto. <laughs> Okay.
I hope that was nice. Um, I wanted to talk about accessibility in software. So, um, yeah, in Pluto we say we're on a mission to make scientific computing more accessible and fun. And yesterday I had a nice conversation about what accessible actually means. Um, and I decided for this talk, it's really nice to talk about it because we're with a lot of software developers. And for this, I just came up with my own definition of accessibility in software. And this is not the definition of accessibility in software, but for 10 minutes that pretend that it is. So I would say that accessibility of a package or software like Julia or Pluto is how easily can users get value out of software? And then I think we should focus on non-traditional users. So how do you get users who do not look and think like you to also use this software and get value out of it? And are different needs and backgrounds taken into account for this? And some examples. A really big one in software accessibility is screen readers. So people with a visual impairment can also use the web, and that's because of screen readers. So there's software that while you're browsing the web, they will just read out everything in human language. And there's prompts to interaction, and then you can interact with it. And this is huge. It means that the web is not just accessible to those with good vision. Um, but if you look at, I think this is the big one that comes to mind for software accessibility. But um, you could also look at it in a slightly broader perspective. And one thing that I find super good is there's some really good accessibility things in Julia's documentation, like differences from MATLAB is one of the pages. And I think for some people, this is exactly the page they need to see to uh, enter Meta, uh, sorry, enter Julia, because the goal is to make Julia accessible, so to get people to use Julia and get value out of it, but you're specifically recognizing that people have a MATLAB background. Uh, one thing, or one uh, project that I find super impressive is called Heidi, by a professor in Leiden called Verdine Hermans, and they made uh, this website called Heidi, where kids can learn textual programming. Um, and it's, the goal is to learn it without prior programming experience. And there's a lot of programs to teach programming to kids, like Scratch or MakeBlock, where you're always dragging blocks around, and you have these beautiful, colorful abstractions of programming where you don't have syntax errors anymore, which is beautiful. But she wanted to empower kids to learn textual programming which kids see as real programming as opposed to fake programming like Excel or Scratch. And so the way they do it is by taking Python and stripping away all the syntax rules until it looks like this. That's level one, Heidi. And then gradually it adds more and more syntax. Super creative. And then one thing is that Heidi also makes textual programming accessible to people with no programming experience in your native language. And they translate it to lots of language, including right to left scripts like Arabic. And so here, not only the tutorials are in Arabic, but also the programming itself. So that means you can type with your Arabic keyword. You don't need to know any English to take this course. That's super cool. Um, so a question for your neighbor. Are you ready? Is scientific computing accessible?
I will just, I'm just putting up the next question. This question is specifically about uh, packages like plots, flux, Julia, Pluto, uh, NumPy, and their developers. And then I want to uh, remember that developers are not monkeys who do whatever you write in issues, but they are volunteers who also have their own goals and needs. And um, with this in mind, what are the benefits to a developer to make a package more accessible? And what are downsides to the developer? Okay, to so sort of round it off. And then the next. Yay. Nice. Thank you, everyone. The reason why uh, I bring this up is that I, my motivation, one of my motivations for learning Julia was this article called. What can a technologist do about climate change? By Brad Victor, I highly recommend it, write it down. And one of the things he argues for is that um, as sort of the privileged computer science people, we have a responsibility to provide the future climate scientists and energy engineers with a civilized computing environment. I found this super nice. So I think we're all so carried, uh, it's so easy to get carried away with things like adding extensions and, and features and everything and oh, just install this one package on the side and my, my thing will be even nicer. That it's easy to forget how hard it is for people to already enter this environment and we're just building maybe more and more. Um, but we really need to empower people to get these tools 
Um, and yeah, to get a civilized computing environment. My last question for you to think about um, in the break, or you can talk about it with me when you see me, um, is to choose a package software that you contribute to, or if you don't, something that you often use, like Julia, NumPy, Plots. And what can we do to make it more accessible? All right, that was my talk, and I'll see you in the break.